Thank you all for joining today's webinar. My name is Jonathan Lucas, and I'll be your moderator today. Please note that all lines are muted and will remain muted for the duration of the webinar. If you have questions, please utilize the chat feature, and your questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. Please also note that this webinar is being recorded and will be posted to the HPTN 071 page on the HPTN website at www.hptn.org. I am absolutely delighted to be joined by Dr. Helen Ells and Dr. Sarah Fiddler, who will discuss the results of HPTN 071, the pop art study. HPTN 071 is the largest HIV prevention trial ever undertaken. The study examined the impact of a package of HIV prevention interventions on community-level HIV incidents. It's important to note that this was community-level and not individual-level, so please keep that in mind, community-level. I'd like to introduce our presenters. Dr. Helen Ells is the Zambia Principal Investigator for HPTN 071. She is a professor, professor of infectious diseases and International Health in the Clinical Research Department in the Faculty of Infectious and Tropical Diseases at London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and the Director of Research at Zambart in Lusaka, Zambia. Her research interest is the combined epidemics of tuberculosis and HIV in the evaluation of large public health interventions. Dr. Ells is joined by Dr. Sarah Fiddler, who is the HPTN 071 Protocol Co-Chair and Professor of Medicine at Empirical College in London. Dr. Fiddler has been involved in designing and leading HIV international clinical studies for participants identified in acute HIV infection and small proof of concept studies in HIV cure. So in short, these two ladies are brilliant. And with that, I'd like to turn the webinar over to Dr. Ells to share study results for HPTN 071. Welcome, Dr. Ells. Thank you very much, Jonathan. I hope everybody can hear me. I'm um, in Zambia on a mobile phone, so um, please, somebody can tell me if, if you can't hear me. So I'm delighted to... Um, present the results of HPTN 071, the pop-up study today. Can we have the next slide, please? Okay, so this is um, the overview of, of the presentation today. I'm going to just give you a brief overview of HPTN and then um, go over the study background, the overview of findings, and talk about some things that are very important to us, which is community engagement uh, and results dissemination before giving you some final thoughts. Next slide, please. So, um, the um, HPTN, uh, next slide, please. So HPTN has more than um, 50 trials currently um, ongoing or completed. Um, it has over 85 um, clinical research sites in 19 countries. And if we can go on to the next slide, you can see the um, breadth of the scientific portfolio, which includes studies looking at um, HIV status, at different populations, including adolescents, um, men and sex with men, um, as well as women, transgender people, and a variety of different interventions, behavioral combination prevention, um, as well as using um, antiretroviral treatments as um, prevention for pre-exposure prophylaxis, and a wide range of different studies. So the HPTN 071 was one of these studies, and so if we move to the next slide, I can tell you why, why we did the HPTN 071 study. I'll generally call it pop-art because um, 
in country we call it pop up it's easier to understand and pop up stands for the population effect of antiretroviral therapy to reduce transmission of hiv so why did we do this study hiv incidence remained um, very high in many parts of southern africa such as zambia where i'm talking to you from today and there's a real urgent need for additional effective hiv prevention strategies next slide please so one of the strategies that has been presented is that of universal testing and treatment. This was first proposed really by mathematical modelers, who in a mathematical model showed that this could really um, cause a dramatic decline in HIV incidence at population level. But the big question that remained was, could you actually do this? Could you actually deliver this in practice in generalized epidemics in Africa? And if you did, what impact on HIV incidence could be achieved? pop Art wasn't the only um, study of um, universal testing and treatment. There have been several other studies which started around the same time, search in um, Kenya and Uganda, and the TARP trial in KwaZulu-Natal showed varying um, levels of uh, feasibility of getting people to test and getting people to, on treatment as soon as possible, but they found no impact on HIV incidence. Another study being conducted at the same time in Botswana did find a reduction in HIV incidence, but this study was conducted in, um, uh, in rural areas in much smaller population size and um, had a borderline statistical significance. So let me tell you about the HPTN 071. Next slide, please. And I, yeah, so HPTN 071 was conducted in Zambia and South Africa. Um, and overall, it had uh, 21 study sites. Now, HPTN was a cluster randomized trial. This may be a term that some people are not that familiar with. I think many people are used to individually randomized trials. But a cluster randomized trial um, randomizes whole groups, uh, which are called clusters. And these can be small clusters, such as schools, or can be very large clusters, such as our case, which were whole communities. And the communities raised in size from about 30,000 people up to over 100,000 people in each of these communities that were randomized. We had 21 sites, 12 in Zambia. And if you look at the map, you can see this is the bottom half of Zambia. And the sites range a distance of um, about 1,200 kilometers from the furthest north to the furthest south, from Livingston in the south up to the Copper Belt in the north. And we also had nine sites in the Western Cape province of South Africa. These were urban sites, um, and in, in South Africa were in um, townships in the Cape Metropole area, as well as in the Winelands area. These 21 communities were put into matched triplets based on geography and baseline HIV prevalence, and these triplets were then randomized into three arms. So there were seven triplets, each with the three arms. And the total population of these communities was approximately 1 million people. So this was a very, very large study. Next slide, please. So what was the um, pop-up intervention? The pop-up intervention was led by a cadre of um, community lay counselors who we called the CHIP. This stands for Community HIV Care Providers. And these were people recruited from the communities in which they were working, who were trained as lay counselors. They worked in pairs, and each pair looked after a zone of the community, which consisted of about 500 households. And they were responsible for those households. And they went door to door, making sure that every single person, and that's adults and children, were involved in the intervention, were given information about HIV, were offered HIV counseling and testing on at least an annual basis, and then could also make referrals depending on the results of that. And so anybody who um, was found to be living with HIV was referred to the local government health facility for um, treatment, and the CHIPS would come back to check that that referral had been made and that everything was all right and to assist with adherence to treatment. In addition, they also um, 
carried out HIV prevention by referring um, HIV negative men for a voluntary medical male circumcision, and they provided condoms and lubricants. They screened the adult population for sexually transmitted infections and screened the whole population for tuberculosis. Um, next slide, please. So the triplets that I talked about, um, as I say, the community were divided into these three arms. So starting um, at the right-hand side of your screen, arm C was standard of care. This entailed whatever HIV testing and treatment um, was going on in that community at the time. At the minimum, it included HIV testing at the health facility and antiretroviral therapy being um, provided free of charge to individuals according to the current national guidelines. To the left of your slide is arm A, which is what we call the full pop-up infection. So that had the CHIPS intervention that I've just described. And for all individuals living with HIV referred to the health facility, they were started on antiretroviral therapy, irrespective of CD4 count. In the middle, we had arm B, which had the full CHIPS intervention, but had antiretroviral therapy according to the current national guidelines. So that was the intervention. And that, as I say, that population who were involved in the intervention was approximately a million people. Out of those people, 2,500 adults were randomly sampled from each community who formed what we called the population cohort. And this was the cohort in which we measured the primary outcomes of HIV incidents by following them annually for 36 months. Next slide, please. This slide shows the study timeline and shows um, that the CHIPS intervention started in the last quarter of 2013 and continued until the end of 2017. So four years with three entire sweeps of the community, which we called annual rounds, so three annual rounds. It also shows the population cohort, this cohort of measure for measurement who were recruited at about the same time and were followed up annually in what we call PC 12, 24, 36. You'll notice that our primary analysis period was from PC12 to PC36 because we knew that it would take some time for this intervention to get um, up to speed in these large communities to get everybody tested um, and treated and virally suppressed before we could see any impact on HIV incidence. And just to remind you that antiretroviral therapy um, eligibility was universal um, throughout in arm A but in arm C and C was according to national guidelines, which started at a CD4 count of less than 350, and then this rapidly moved to a CD4 count of um, 500 um, before moving to universal um, treatment in 2016. Next slide, please. So <clears throat> the primary objective of the HPTN 071 trial was to measure the impact of this pop art intervention package on new HIV cases, so HIV incidence. And the primary measurement was to compare arm A, so the full intervention arm with arm C, and arm B with arm C. Next slide. We have a lot of secondary objectives, and I'm not going to be able to talk about them all today, but um, they included um, measuring the uptake of the intervention package on community-level HIV testing and art initiation. And next slide, please also on measuring the impact on viral suppression, again, um, at community level, comparing arm A to arm C. Viral suppression is really important in the pathway of how this intervention of universal testing and treatment could impact HIV incidence. Because what we're trying to do is we're trying to get every single person in a community virally suppressed so that they don't transmit virus to others. Okay, so let's now move on to the results. Next slide, please. So first of all, just talking about the intervention activities. As I mentioned, this um, included three rounds conducted over four years. And um, these are just some of the numbers to give you the idea of the scale of the intervention. This is the final round of the intervention. And in South Africa, the teams visited 55,500 households um, with... Um, 79,000 adults consenting to be part of the intervention. In Zambia, we had slightly more sites, and so it was 98,000 households were visited in the last round, 
and um, over 181,000 adults consenting to participate. Uh, next slide, please. So I would just like to remind everybody about the UNA 90-90-90 targets, because I'm going to talk about these, and sometimes um, we recognize that we're not all um, closely up to speed on the 90-90-90. So just to remind us that these targets, the first 90 is that 90% of all people living with HIV will know their status. The second 90 is that 90% of people living with HIV who know their status are taking um, antiretroviral therapy. And the third 90 is that 90% of those individuals are virally suppressed. Next slide, please. So I want to show you the coverage estimates for the first two of those UNA's 90-90-90 targets. And this is data taken from our intervention data. And so just covers arm A and arm B because they were the intervention arms and that's where we have this data available from. And what this graph shows is it shows percentage on the y-axis and then it shows the first 90, the second 90, and the product of those two, which is ART coverage amongst all people living with HIV, um, as the um, third um, set of bars. The yellowy bars are the start of round one, and the blue bars are the end of round three. So if you, um, and this shows, as I say, arm A and arm B, and you can see that coverage is very similar in both um, of those arms. Um, and reached about 90 for the first 90 and the second 90, um, with coverage being the product of the two. So we're aiming for um, about 81% being met in arm A and just about met in arm B. Next slide, please. So all of the other data that I'm going to tell you about now come from this population cohort. So this is the red box at the bottom, which is the random sample of adults aged 18 to 44 who were recruited from each um, of the, um, uh, of the uh, communities. Yeah. If, you next, if you advance the slide, you can show that this is diagrammatically shown by showing that we actually picked these people randomly from each community in each arm. And the total size of this cohort was aimed to be 52,500. So this is, there's been some confusion that the study was conducted in 52,500 people. That's not true. The intervention and the study was conducted in a population of a million, but the measurement cohort was 52,500. So if we can go to the next slide, please, we'll show you how we did with recruiting um, those individuals. So this is the total number of people in that cohort in arm A, B, and C. And these are baseline data to show comparability across the three arms of the trial. And you can see that approximately um, 12,500 to 13,000 people were recruited in each of those arms. And the vast majority of these were women. Um, we had 70% females and um, approximately 30% men in each of the arms, um, as we did struggle somewhat to find men um, to, to take part in this in this um, cohort. Next slide, please. This was a predominantly young cohort. We, people who were eligible if they were aged between 18 and 44, but you can see that the 18 to 24 year old age group consisted of about 40% in all of the arms. Um, and so really this is a very young cohort. Next slide, please. The next slide shows the prevalence of HIV at baseline in these arms. And our HIV prevalence at baseline was very high, it was about 21% overall. The other striking um, feature was that HIV prevalence was approximately double in women compared to what it was in men. So about 25% of women were HIV positive at baseline and about 12% um, of men. Next slide, please. <clears throat> we asked individuals in the population cohort if they knew their HIV status, and if they did, whether they would share that with us. And if somebody shared that they were um, living with HIV, we asked whether they were receiving antiretroviral therapy. 
we also took a blood sample at each visit. So we also knew who was actually living with HIV. So we also knew for people who themselves might not have um, tested or might not have known. Mm. And at baseline, approximately 35% um, over the arms, a little bit different as you can see in different arms, were taking antiretroviral therapy at baseline. So now those were all the baseline um, data and really to try to show you that these three arms were largely comparable. Um, and now I want to move on to the primary study outcome, which is new cases of HIV or HIV incidence. Now, one thing I need to explain, I need to explain this graph very carefully because this is the key result. This was a matched cluster randomized trial. And so we have to analyze it in a matched way. On this graph, on the y-axis, you'll see incidence as um, the incidence per 100 person year. So if you like, the percentage per year incidence. And that goes from 0 to 3% on the y-axis. You will also see a series of lines. Each color represents a different triplet. Um, because, as I say, they were matched, we have to analyze them in a matched way. Also, you'll see the dots at the end of the line. Each of those dots, the size of that, represents the number of events in that, in that actual community. Overall, between PC12 and PC36, which was our primary analysis period, we had 550 incident cases of HIV distributed amongst these 21 communities. Now, what I would like you to do, first of all, is to look at the graph on the right, which compares arm B with arm C. And what you can see is across the board, HIV incidence is lower in arm B than it is in arm C for each colored line. Um, this is a per almost perfect result showing that for every pair where we had the intervention in arm B compared to its control in arm C, we had a lower HIV incidence. Now if you look to the left-hand panel, you'll see um, the picture for the arm A versus arm C comparison. And for that comparison, you'll see that four of the lines go in that same direction, that the incidence was lower in arm A than in arm C. But three of the lines go in the opposite direction, such that incidence was higher in arm A compared to arm C. So how does this translate into numbers? If we look at the next slide, we can see on the table, we can see the overall HIV incidence by arm. Um, and if you look at arm C, you'll see that 1.55%. And if you look for arm A, it's 1.45%, and for arm B, 1.06%. So for the arm B versus arm C comparison, this is a 30% reduction with an adjusted rate ratio of 0 0.7, which is highly statistically significant. So very unlikely to have occurred by chance. For the arm A versus arm C comparison, you can see that this is a 7% reduction, which is not statistically significant. Next slide, please. We also looked at this by different subgroups, by men, women, younger adults, and older adults. Younger here being 18 to 24 and older 25 plus. On the y-axis is incidence in percent. And the first thing I think that's very striking is that men overall had a lower incidence than women, about half that of women, and that younger individuals had um, a higher incidence than older individuals. And again, if um, you look at the arm C versus um, arm, which is in green, that's the control arm, and arm C is the blue, and uh, um, I mean arm A is blue, and arm B is red you can see the reduction in those arms. The reduction amongst men was greater than the reduction amongst women um, in that arm B versus arm C comparison. Again, the reduction was greater in the older people than it was in the younger people. And, you know, people um, are sometimes a little bit confused about this when I present this, but I think this does make perfect sense. We saw women having a very, very high uptake of the intervention and very high levels of viral suppression amongst women, which I'll show you later. And this really protected the men in their communities more. So 
I think that's why we're seeing this bigger protection in men. Conversely, we saw in younger people not such good uptake of interventions, and I think that's why the younger people were, were protected less. The next slide, please, because I'm now going to show you the viral suppression data from this cohort. So just to um, remind you, the HIV incidence was measured in people who were HIV negative at baseline and who zero converted to be HIV positive in that measurement period, whereas viral suppression obviously was measured in people living with HIV. So these are individuals um, within the PC who were HIV positive. So next slide, please. So the primary analysis, again, is looking at viral suppression, comparing the intervention arm, arm A and B, with arm C. So if we just start with arm C, the control um, arm, overall viral suppression in this arm was 63%. So that is 63% of all individuals um, who were HIV positive in that arm were virally If you look on um, A, the um, viral suppression was 72%, so significantly higher than arm C, and arm B was in between at 68%. Now, viral suppression is the um, product of the UNA's 1990-90 target. And so if we multiply 90 by 90 by 90, we get 73%. So you can see that in arm A, we were extremely close to, to reaching the 1990-90 um, uh, target, and in arm B, we were just almost there, whereas arm C still is a little bit further behind. Again, let's look at subgroups of men and women, and younger and older. And on this um, graph, we can see again that women had a much higher level of viral suppression than men. And um, this very much fits with our intervention data, which shows that we struggle to reach men. More men, by the end of the study, um, more men than women did not know their status and were not yet on antiretroviral therapy. And so we expected viral suppression amongst men to be um, less good, and that was indeed what we saw. But you can see still that in the men, in the intervention arm, the red and blue, there was a, an increase in viral suppression, as there was in women, but it was very high even in the control arm of women. I think more worryingly is when we look at the younger versus the older. In the younger age group, the 18 to 24 age group, we can see that viral suppression is really at a very low level, only about 40%, with slight increases in the intervention arm, but not high enough. Whereas in the older age group, viral suppression is higher, and the increases caused by the intervention were better. And these findings largely um, uh, predict the um, findings on incidence because, of course, we need viral suppression in the HIV-positive individuals to make a difference on HIV incidence in individuals who are HIV negative. And you can see that we had less effect on the younger age group and we had better effect in the older age group. And again, conversely, the higher viral suppression in women protected men more, so we saw a bigger difference in HIV incidence amongst men than we did in women. The next slide, please. So this was a community randomized trial. And so communities are vitally important in, in this, um, in this uh, study. And community engagement was very important. A whole army was needed to do this. And um, this is just a depiction of who was out in the field on a daily basis. The chips, who by far were the most important people for the intervention, there were over 650 chips working in the, um, in the eight intervention, um, sorry, in the 14 intervention communities. Sorry, I always think of Zambia where we had eight. But we also had community mobilizers. We had research nurses and research enumerators who really worked in the population cohort, collecting the results, um, the data with the results I've just shown you, and drivers and um, other people needing to go into the field. Next slide, please. We have to remember as well that communities are not all the same. These communities, whilst they were all urban or peri-urban, um, in 
they were very different. They had different histories of the HIV response in their communities. They had different levels of HIV. You, um, some communities, particularly those, um, some of the communities in South Africa had a much lower prevalence of HIV. And also the uptake of the intervention and the way that the community engaged was also very different. So we had to adapt to make sure that our interventions worked for those communities. So how did we do this? Next slide, please. We were, relied very heavily on our community advisory board. Um, we conducted stakeholder analysis um, at the beginning of the trial and recruited adults from each community to represent the community on the community advisory board. As we increased our work to cover adolescents, we also decided to need a separate adolescent community advisory board. And in Zambia, um, where as you could see the distances were great, um, members of each of these formed a national cap. In South Africa, the distances were smaller, so they could have one cap that represented all of their communities. We also had community partners platform, which involved civil society organizations working in these communities so that we could ensure that their voice was heard and they could monitor what we did. And we also had implementation management teams working in each of the districts and also nationally to make sure that everything from the community and the clinic were really well coordinated and all the many partners. Next slide, please. As I've mentioned, this is a community randomized trial, and so we needed to randomize these communities into the arm. And we did this by uh, holding a public randomization um, event, which was held both simultaneously in South Africa and Zambia, done by pulling balls, soccer balls out, which um, allowed us to divide the community into the different arms, and then again, some other balls allowed us to allocate which um, intervention went to which arm. And it's very important for communities to be involved in this and to see that this is chance and that it's not somebody just picking their community over another. Next slide, please. The other thing that we found, we've always found is very important is to ensure that we um, get the results back to the community. Um, and so we consulted with the community members and the community advisory boards towards the end of the study implementation period on how we should lead these communities and how to prepare communities to receive these results. And we did training with CAB members to make sure they understood all the key terms that I've used, for example, in this webinar, to make sure everybody understood what those terms meant and how to interpret these results. Next slide, please. We, the actual results dissemination, we used a community dialogue process where we shared the results, but we took a very participatory approach um, and allowed um, the participants to analyze the results themselves and come up with what they thought these results meant. We invited over 50 um, representative community members in each community, um, from the CAB, the ACAB participants who've been part of the PC, part of the CHIP intervention, health workers and other interest groups. And I think this has been a fantastic process and um, the community, these are a couple of quotes really saying how proud they feel to be part of it and how they felt respected by this process. Next slide, please. I think one thing we um, really would like to um, emphasize is how the um, community advisory structures and the community representation has been so important in allowing us to um, attain the results that we have attained and um, is vitally important for all studies and all interventions of this type going forward. So next slide, please. So in summary, the pop-up intervention was amazingly successful. We achieved the first two 1990 targets, which I've shown you in both arms A and B. And when we looked at our virus suppression measured in our population cohort, we can see we actually achieved all three of the 1990s. There are very, very few places in the world where 1990 has been achieved. And this was achieved in both of our intervention arms. The Compart intervention package with universal testing and antiretroviral therapy according to local guidelines reduced HIV incidence by 30%. And these are in the highest burden, most difficult urban communities. And this 30% is 30% at population level. This is not amongst the people who took part in the study. This is 
representing the whole population. Now, we do need to remember that because guidelines change throughout the course of the study, immediate universal antiretroviral therapy was available midway through the study and for most of the primary measurement period. And so, again, I'm you know, people have been a bit confused. Is this really universal test and treat? Yes, this is a universal test and treat. And universal test and treat reduce HIV by 30%. Next slide, please. I think, however, the um, lesser effect in arm A, which was the full pop intervention arm with universal treatment from the beginning of the study, here, if you remember, we saw a 7% reduction we were a bit surprised by this because we all expected this to have a larger effect than the arm B intervention. One explanation for this could have been that the intervention was not taken up as well. But actually, I've shown you data to show that the intervention was taken up very well. And actually, viral suppression was higher in arm A than arm B, slightly. But this really, this difference doesn't um, explain this, um, this finding. So we're really looking at what could have explained this. We do have a lot of data which we hope will shed more light on this. We've already looked at um, lots of bits of data. There's been concern about um, sexual risk disinhibition, and we're looking at data on that. But um, fortunately, we also have phylogenetic analysis. So we have, um, from some of our communities, we have uh, many, many um, sequence data from many, many um, individuals living with HIV. And so we know the, um, the common sequences circulating uh, in a population. And we are now sequencing those individuals who seroconverted during the population cohort, those 550 odd, so that we can see whether it looks like their um, infection was caught from somebody within the community or whether it was caught from outside the community whether it was caught from somebody else with acute HIV or whether it might have been from somebody who had had HIV for a long time and maybe been on treatment but wasn't virally suppressed. And I think this phylogenetic analysis will allow us to really tease out what happened here. You have to remember that in a community randomized trial, we draw the boundary around the community and we apply an intervention within that area. But of course, Many, you know, communities are not islands, and many people travel in and out of these communities for work and for pleasure, and so we can't influence what goes on outside of that boundary. Next slide, please. Overall, what I think this study has really shown us are that community-based services for HIV testing and linkage are vital, and that universal HIV testing um, paired with universal treatment is um, a key component of how we're going to end the HIV epidemic, particularly in these high burden urban settings. Our intervention worked well overall, but we had gaps. The biggest gap, um, which I showed you in some of the data, but didn't have time to show all, was really that we didn't meet men um, in terms of uh, test getting them enough men to test and get onto treatment early enough. We came up with additional strategies as the study went on where we recognized this gap. And I think we do have some good ideas to take forward. But men are a big challenge um, for us and for these results. And I think the other big challenge which I mentioned is um, the youth. We saw very high levels of HIV incidence in these young people, and we also saw very low levels of viral suppression in this population. And so we need to do a lot more to engage the youth. So finally, um, if we just move on the slide, um, there's additional information available um, online. And I think these um, slides will probably also be posted online. Um, although um, Jonathan may be able to tell us a bit more about that. And um, I'd just like to acknowledge the funders of this work. This work was um, sponsored by the National Institute of Health, the NIAID, and funded by PEPFAR, um, uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation through the 3IE, and the National Institute of Health. It was a massive study, as I've already mentioned, um, which involved many, many individuals and institutions 
and they're all on the next slide, if you could see that, and included both the research institutions, um, London School of Hygiene, Imperial College, HPTN, Zambar, DTTC in, in South Africa, but also many government agencies and PEPFAR implementing partners. Um, but finally, I would really like to say an amazing thank you to all the um, communities and the study participants. They were amazing all the way through. I think we started off with a fairly skeptical community, but they really embraced this intervention. Um, they joined in, they participated, they allowed us to visit them constantly in their homes. They allowed us to take blood from them every year to get these um, results um, for you from the research cohort. And without them and their community advisory boards, none of this would be possible. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Dr. Ells. Excellent, excellent, excellent presentation. We have we do have a few um, questions from the chat, from the audience. Um, I think the question that's on everyone's mind is why we didn't see a greater effect in Arm A. I can recall sitting down with the scientists here at the HPTN's Leadership and Operations Center to review the data and telling them that the data in the arms was mixed up, that this just couldn't be right, especially given the viral suppression um, data. What do you say in response to those people like me who are looking at these results and, and sort of scratching their heads? Yeah, I mean, I think it is a bit confusing. But I think when I look at that RMA graph, I look and I see that there are four pairs of, um, of uh, arm A and arm C comparisons. There are four pairs that look exactly like arm B. And then there are three that are a bit different. And we have to remember that communities are really different. And as I, as I said before, you know, these communities are slightly artificial. We to define the boundary as being the catchment population of a health facility, but people do travel in and out of these, um, of these communities. People have said to us, why don't you just combine these results? And when we do combine the arm A and the arm B, we see a 20% reduction in incidence, which is highly statistically significant as well. And so I think we can say convincingly that, that this intervention works. But we still need to get more information on where it didn't work and why it didn't work. We've looked hard at the intervention. We can't see that. We're looking harder at sexual risk disinhibition to see whether it's possible that individuals in these communities felt they would be protected and so may be indulged in riskier sex, stopped using condoms, although we have no evidence for that at the moment. I personally am putting my faith in the phylogenetics because I think that we could see that particularly in those sites where the um, incidence really doesn't seem to match the level of viral suppression that we reached, that maybe some of those infections were coming from somewhere else. And so even if, you know, and so we couldn't have prevented those. Thank you. Um, another question is, does the protocol team have any plans to do any modeling to see what the effect might have been over a long, longer period of time? Yeah, thanks very much for that question. I should have mentioned that. We have a very big and very um, active modeling group who work with us. And um, they, are, they have um, a very complex individually based model and they're actively putting all the data into that model right now. And I mentioned um, that we saw this 30% reduction at community level. And I think some people are saying, oh, that's not very much, we were expecting more. But I think you need to remember that this was over a very short period. This is over four years at a whole population level. I know that on um, you know, a rapid sort of modeling process, when you take this and you run it in the model, if you run it over, for example, a 10-year period, you would see more than doubling of this effect. Because, of course, um, if we can maintain um, viral suppression and maintain low levels of transmission, Another question that we received was related to the gender breakdown. When you were reviewing the data about the different arms, the the demographics with the different arms, those communities were, were quite similar. Um, but there were questions about um, the gender breakdown, 70% female and then 30% um, male. 
was this random or by design? And if it was random, why do you think that there were a, there was such a lower percentage of males when compared to females? Yeah, so I, I am Mrs. Helen. I'm back online. I, I did lose my line for a while. So it wasn't um, <clears throat> it wasn't deliberate. We um, or the, the individual selected were randomly selected um, at population level. And how we randomly selected individuals was that we had a, a census. We enumerated every household in these in these communities. We randomly selected households, and then we visited each of the households enumerated all of the um, individuals living in the households and randomly selected one of them to be part of the population cohort. Now, there are a couple of factors that made um, it unbalanced between women and men. One is that more women were enumerated than men, and I think sometimes men aren't regarded as being members of households because they move around a bit more. Secondly, women were easier to find than men. Often the men were not in the household, and despite multiple efforts to find them, we, um, we couldn't find so many. And men were more likely to refuse um, participation than the women. So as I say, this was in the population cohort. Actually, it worked against us because, as you could see, um, because the intervention was taken up slightly better by women, the effect of the intervention was greater in men. And so this, if, if anything, this result minimizes the effect of this intervention. Um, and so it's unfortunate that we couldn't get um, equal numbers of men and women in Thank you. Another question that we got are, um, what are the ongoing discussions at policy community levels around sustainability of the door-to-door, -door, the CHIPS intervention outside the trial, given that they were um, shown to be affected? What is currently happening in the trial communities in terms of provision of that particular service? Yes, and this is a very good point, and we're in um, conversation right now with policymakers for how to how we can continue this intervention because clearly it's effective, and so clearly we do need to continue it. Um, we are just finalising our calculations of the cost effectiveness of this intervention, which I think will be needed for policymakers to really um, make their decisions. Um, obviously, we know the cost of the intervention, and certainly in Zambia, where I work, I know that this intervention costs seven dollars fifty per person reached, which I don't think is is too much. Um, this is that's annually, um, but we need to calculate the actual cost effectiveness. So the cost per HIV infection averted, and um, uh, and also for life years saved. So um, those are the calculations that will also involve the mathematical modelling to to extend it um, beyond the, just the trial period. HIV testing is being ramped up, um, and I think some of the other innovations that we tested out in the pop-up study, for example, HIV self-testing, which we included towards the end, um, those are being ramped up and scaled up. But still, I think there's a focus on facility-level testing and index case testing, but not yet on universal testing. Um, so we are working with policymakers trying to get them those cost effectiveness figures as soon as possible. And um, I think the plan will be to try and see how we could take this intervention forward, not in a trial setting, but in a real, uh, uh, you know, even a, more of a real world setting. This was pretty real world that we did the study, but even more real world so that it's affordable and could be rolled out to whole countries. Thank you, Dr. Ells. Um, another question is, with respect to the 90-90-90, um, can you clarify what you were saying about which arms met the targets and which arms did not? Yeah. So if you, um, overall, uh, both um, A and B were very close to those targets. As I said, if you take the product, of 90-90-90, you have 73% viral suppression amongst all people living with HIV. And we were 72% in, in arm A, and it was 68% in arm B. If we use the intervention data, we can see that we achieved the um, first 90 in both arms A and B overall. But there were some gaps, I have to mention, amongst 
some age groups, um, youngest age group particularly, and men. And for the second 90, we, uh, in our, um, uh, I think we, we reached about 89% of the 90. And again, I think a lot of people talk about 90, 90, 90 in their clinic settings, but this is in the whole population, everybody living with HIV in the population. So um, if anything, arm A is slightly better than arm B, which is a little bit, that, you know, that's why it doesn't quite make sense with the incidence status that we have. So Dr. Ells, another question that we got was about the community engagement mechanisms for uh, the pop art study. Were all, um, were all of those funded by the trial teams or were they independently funded and implemented? No, they were all um, funded by the trial itself. I mean, even before we had the funding for the trial, um, we have very good relationships with many communities, and we've had community advisory boards for, many, for all of our studies for a very long time. And the community members were actually very much involved in helping us to plan this whole protocol. They had input into writing the protocol and into designing the intervention, told us some things we wanted to do they didn't think were a good idea, and vice versa. Um, and so those were even before the, the study funding came along. But then when the funding came along, that that funded all of um, these activities that I've talked about. Thank you. Those were all of our questions, and I want to be respectful of your time. We only have um, about five minutes left. Um, would you like to provide any final thoughts to the audience today? Yes, I think the final thoughts that I would like to um, give are, you know, I started out this trial, I mean, we started thinking about it a long time ago, and I started out with this trial because I looked at those mathematical models that were, showed, that were done for universal test and treat, and I just said, this is impossible, this can't be done at community level. So I really entered this study as quite a skeptic, and my whole view has been changed. You know, these universal testing is entirely possible. We have demonstrated that conclusively, that universal testing and linkage for universal treatment is possible. The community welcome it, and um, it just takes us to really figure out innovative ways to deliver this service to make sure we can reach all people. I think also this study now has conclusively shown that universal test and treat reduces HIV incidence. And so now we need to figure out how to implement this on a much wider scale. Uh, uh, as the pop art team, we're very um, happy to uh, acknowledge the areas where we didn't do so well. And the areas we didn't do so well were in reaching men and reaching young people. And so I think those are our focuses going forward. How can we better reach the men and how can we better reach young people so that we can really make sure this is truly universal and reaches every single person in the population. Thank you so much, Dr. L. Um, for those of you who participated on the webinar, please be reminded that these slides will be made available later this week. Um, we're going to be posting them on the HPTN's website, www.hptn.org, on the um, HPTN 071 study page. On that page, you can also get additional information related uh, to the study. I believe there's press releases and fact sheets and FAQs, so a lot of good information there. Um, again, thank you for participating, um, and we look forward to uh, working with you all again in the future and, and providing you dissemination information such as this for our research portfolio. Thank you again, and you all have a wonderful day.